Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 So I studied copyright laws for six months. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know my rights. Should we? Ready? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, Dennis is here, so we can get started. You get two hours. I I I don't know which one you're talking to. I I feel the same way about eating when I'm talking. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Toronto Citizen Developer User Group. Yay. So the Toronto Citizen Developer User Group, and I hope I don't have to say that too many times today, uh, is really talking about three types of enabling technologies, which are you know Power, uh, Power Apps, Power BI, and Flow. But it's it's really something that right now Microsoft calls the Power Platform. That can change over over time. And in fact, you know, there's some elements of SharePoint that are about uh, enabling citizen developers because SharePoint allows you to customize lists and do stuff like that. So we're not always going to be talking about these these products, but really this is what our area of focus is, uh, at least today. Originally, I would have loved, let's see if that's going to work. I would have loved to be able to call this the uh, the Power Platform user group, but there's already a Power Platform user because <laughs> I had the whole logo figured out and everything. Um, and this is something that's important. What, what when we're talking about citizen developers versus the Power Platform user group, they're not competing <coughs> with each other. They're very complementary to each other, right? So while the Power Platform user group is really talking about the technology and you know doing demos and, and things like that. The Citizen Developer User Group is more about um, talking to a kind of a different type of audience, talking about the business users and the IT decision makers and some developers in there. But uh, it's you know it's really a different level, different level of conversation. So if you are interested in Power BI, Flow, uh, what's the other one? Power Apps. <laughs> I encourage you to uh, to go to the the Power Platform User Group and you're. Welcome to use my logo. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. Yeah, we're recording. So if you swear, you'll actually uh, we have an AI that will replace it to you'll say Microsoft Bob every time you swear. <laughs> All right. So what? This is gonna be fun. Okay. So what is a citizen developer? So. According to Gartner, a citizen developer is a user who creates new business applications for consumption by others using development and runtime environment sanctioned by corporate IT. Now, I personally don't like the term user because it's usually demeaning, right? I prefer people. It's made of people. Um, the other thing that is important here is that it's sanctioned by corporate IT. And this is one of the big topics that we're going to be talking about in these in these future events. It's about how do we, as you know, IT decision makers and you know CTOs and all these guys, how do we enable and empower citizen developers to do what they want to do? Right? They want to build apps. They want to improve their processes or their team's processes, and they want to use the tools that are available to them. And there's two ways we can do this. We can block them and say, oh, no, I'm not going to let them do that. But then what they're going to do, if they really have a need, they're going to start create their own shadow IT. They're going to start going to Dropbox and you know do stuff that you no longer are able to control or audit. Right? So it's better to embrace them and to allow them to do what they want to do and kind of create the boundaries that will allow them to do so safely. 
<clears throat> Microsoft, for example, they actually, even though, like if you think about Microsoft as a big corporation, uh, they use Dynamics, they use SharePoint, they use uh, all sorts of products like that. They actually allow all their employees to build Power Platform applications using their production systems, which may sound scary, but you know, eat their own dog food, right? They're they're using the products that they sell, and they are absolutely empowering. Device. Hans actually has built an application for his CRM stuff. How long did it take you again from nothing? Uh, maybe four hours. Four hours. And like Hans had never touched, this is Hans, by the way, Hans had never touched uh, the Power Platform before. So this is kind of cool. And he's connecting to production CRM, <coughs> production OneNote. Uh, sure. Really the big one is they allowed us access to our CRM implementation directly. So as a sales guy, I have to update opportunities weekly. And the management always wants to know. And it was, um, I don't know, the screen is quite busy to kind of navigate through it. So if you get exactly what I needed, it was very simple to create uh, an app that was also delivered mobile to my boss. <coughs> All right, so there is a bit of a delay. So by the way, we're trying this, this new thing. Uh, we're trying to, um, in future events, we're going to try to accept these events. So they're live events, Microsoft Live, Microsoft Teams live events, so that people who want to attend remotely can do so without having to come in. Now, of course, it's not gonna be a school if you're at home by yourself, um, and we can't fax you pizza or anything like that, but uh, if you can't do it, uh, in fact, we also have uh, MVP presenters from all over the world that are lined up to actually speak at future events, which is very exciting. And they will do so through uh, Microsoft Live Events. So we will be suffering a little bit today because this is our first time trying it. We're not really broadcasting it anywhere. We're just testing it, testing recording. Um, but who is the audience for this? And this concludes our meeting. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, who's our audience for for the Citizen Developer User Group? Well, we kind of have the developers, um, the Citizen Developers, who are again we talked about it. They're people who are not really developers, but they want to improve processes in their organization, right? They use it either for themselves, or for their group, or their department, <coughs> or in some cases for the entire company. Right? So they want to create. That's really what they want to do. And then we have the developers. And notice how I didn't make the developer this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I did notice. Yeah. <laughs> so the developers, what do they want to do? Well, as developers, when we talk about citizen developers, our role as developers is changing a little bit. Because now we're able to start uh, enabling the citizen developers by creating things like APIs that they can connect to, uh, creating uh, PCF, the Power, Power Apps, Apps Control Component, Control Component Framework. Framework. So they can now create components that they can embed, people can embed in their Power Apps, which means they can also embed them in their CRM dynamics. Um, this is great because now we're able to focus, as developers, we're able to focus our efforts on really enabling these people to do some cool stuff. And instead of being the guy that every year has to rebuild the, the uh, annual <clears throat> sign-off form, you know, because that's what we have to do, now we can actually enable the citizen developers to every year update their form the way they need it, and we worry about the stuff that we need to connect to or the stuff that we need to present to them. This is a great opportunity. And then at the other end of the spectrum, IT leadership. And IT leadership what they want to do is empower citizen developers and empower developers, I guess. <clears throat> but it's really about kind of building that, that safe framework that people can do what they want to do without really worrying about, oh, you need to talk to us first before you start building an app or you know, we need to approve it. It's like, no, we're going to create the, the infrastructure and the framework for you to do all this cool stuff and then go nuts because Honestly, your, your citizen developers, your business users, often are talking in a whole different domain of expertise, right? They're talking about their business. They're thinking about how things work in their, in their life. 
they're not worrying about the IT stuff. And you, as the IT person, don't really understand their domain of expertise. So why try to go for a lowest common denominator? Like, I'm only going to allow people to do the stuff that I understand, right? That's not what we're trying to do here. So these uh, meetings, the citizen developers user groups, are really about having these conversations. So we will have demos. We'll always try to have demos. We'll always try to have something that's not so technical. That's more like, here's some cool stuff you can do. There's always going to be something that's a bit more technical, which should be appealing to the, the more developers, people in the audience. And we're always going to try to have some discussions about IT leadership and empowering citizen developers. And we'll obviously talk about this with, with you guys, but we have, you know, some maybe some meetings we'll just, we won't do code, we won't do demos, we'll just have honest discussions. This is, you know, what I'm experiencing in my company, or this is, I got these users, they're really bugging me, they want to do this, but I'm afraid they're going to destroy my systems. Let's have these conversations. That's what this is about. All right, so what we're trying to do is our meetings are going to be the first Wednesdays of every month. So in theory, our next one's going to be November 6th. It really depends on whether the pizza guy's going to be ready for us in time. It's but, my birthday, please bring Don't feel that. <laughs> yes, please have pizza. Uh, like I said earlier, nobody's leaving until all the pizza is gone. Um, so we'll confirm the dates. Uh, and what we want to do here is we really want everyone to contribute here. This is not about Hugo from Point Alliance or the Microsoft guys to, to talk. Like This is for everyone to contribute. And this is open to... Uh, not just, you know, Microsoft Point Alliance, it's open to all the partners, it's open to everyone who wants to demo stuff. We want this to be a conversation, okay? So how can you contribute? Well, the first thing is ask questions. Uh, and this is both asking questions here while we're here, but also online. We've enabled discussion groups. So if you have questions, you're running into some problems with Power Apps, you know, Power BI, Flow, or any other stuff that's really related to citizen developers, um, go ask the questions. We're hoping that everyone here will participate. But the other thing you can do is start discussions, like not just asking questions, but really start having heavy duty, deep philosophical, if I could say that word, uh, heavy duty conversations about how we're gonna do this. Right? How are you guys experiencing these problems and how are you solving it in your organization? And the last one is present. If you have a cool demo, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a professional speaker or not, or whether it's super technical or not. If you've done something that you you're, you feel proud of that you want to share, let us know. Because there's other people in this room who are just starting to look at this kind of stuff, and they will benefit from it. And you might you know, give someone the spark of an idea of, oh, this is cool. I never thought I could do this. So today, we have Hans from Microsoft, who will be talking to us about the Power Platform. And then we have Lou, also from Microsoft, who will be doing us a cool demo on his, and this is so weird, we're at Microsoft and we're getting a demo from an iOS device. <laughs> uh, and then Hanil, who will be doing a technical demo about, it's around the world and Around the world in 60 minutes. That's right. So power apps. But it's one of the focus of the presentation is really about you know uh, localization and, and biological <coughs> applications, which is something that's relevant for pretty much everybody here, right? If you're if you work for a company that's Canadian, you probably should be aware of this. So let's get started with Hans. Thanks, Hugo. Okay, so my name is Hans Westfall. I'm what's called a modern workplace specialist. I've worked with some of you guys in the past. Long time Microsoft guy. I actually got hired in 2000 as a developer and kind of done lots of different roles along the way. <clears throat> and um, when we look at this platform, it kind of brings me back to a lot of things. When I first started developing, it was really on Visual Basic Sims, if you can kind of remember that. What you see is what you get. 
And I see this platform kind of falling into that <clears throat> kind of um, experience, if you will, where you can get something really quickly and you don't really have to um, you know, be a hardcore C++ developer or something like that. So I'm gonna walk through the who, what, where, why, and how, on really what the Power Platform um, kind of is. So this is uh, a quote from, from Satya. I don't know if you guys saw today, the, do you guys see the new services coming yeah. out by chance? Yeah. I'm gonna catch that with the, oh yeah? Yeah, I thought, I thought it was pretty good. Um, but essentially what we're seeing in the next five years, the number of apps that we have to write, there's just not enough developers to write them. So if you think about what Microsoft does very well, I would say is one is integration and making things kind of work together. But the other thing is raising the levels of abstraction so that more and more people make it make uh, access to technology and kind of really up approachable. So there's this newer, newer category called, called low code, no code, which is really where the Power Apps platform um, kind of fits in. So if we look at, so that was Satya's point of view, here's Gartner has a quadrant for it. You can see um, where Microsoft sits. You can see Salesforce with their force platform is another pretty good, I would say, solution in this space. But by 2024, 64% of the applications developed in the enterprise will be a no-code, low-code solution. <clears throat> so who are the major competitors here? Uh, Okay, Mendex, OutSystems, Microsoft, and Salesforce. To be honest, I don't really know the other ones. Anybody know any or work with any of the other platforms? Mendex, I've heard of, but I've never really. Um, Zoho is a CRM tool, right? ServiceNow, everybody knows. We use ServiceNow internally. Like that's, that's yeah. a big part of our, our platform. Pega is an old. Um, uh, business flow application, right? Yeah, but but those are those are like just. Is it, is, is mostly like for um, the HR application, then yeah. um, they're not for development, right. for the no-code development. Well, Salesforce, I would say, falls into that. If I look at it as a business person, what I can do with that platform, it's quite, you can do a lot with the UX and stuff and create your own kind of data entities, et cetera, and be able to operate on those. Yeah, but if, if, I mean, if you look at, the, there's a like, there's like Google, like AWS, <laughs> yeah. if you're talking about the no-code platforms, those are mostly on, on uh, around the, um, the the you know like financials or, or HR like mm. Salesforce or anything like that. But the no code, Google I think comes also with right now in a in a very. What do they have? <clears throat> they have? I don't know GCP, but I don't know. I haven't seen any of their, their no code solution. They have they have like the um, for AI applications as well. Mm. They have the uh, the auto auto machine learning, AML. Yeah. They, mm, the one thing that I that I look at when I look at flow in particular, you guys are familiar with if fish then that, you know, that yeah, kind of yeah. web switchblade application I kind of look at it where you can connect stuff together. That's where I see flow really falling into, without a doubt. Um, Power Apps kind of stands by itself if you and not Power Apps, but Power BI is just the next level of data visualization. So that's a tip low definitely was a uh, I would say a very good competitor in that space. But the Power Apps itself. I mean, making these these canvases and painting apps, kind of like Lego assembly, I call it. I don't really know. There's that many, you know, people in the space yet. But no, but that's not. the thing about this this uh, quadrant here. Yeah. This magic quadrant is it's this is the kind of the partners that or the vendors that do kind of all three areas, right? So yeah. Like, uh, business intelligence workflow and whatever the third one is. So that's, for example, why you see K2 in there, but Nintex is not in there. Right? Yeah. I, um... OK. So yeah, how do you, if you think about building apps, and we've probably all done this for a while, we're kind of doing three things. We're analyzing, we're adding, we're doing something, and then we're always going to go into automation, right? So what does it look like from a platform perspective? So Power BI we've touched on already, Power Apps, Flow we've touched on. The bigger ones though, more kind of, uh, I would say plumbing, which are interesting, is obviously the data connectors. If you've ever done a SQL connection string, you know what that is. It's the next level of that, I'm connecting to anything I need to. So. You look at what you get if you're an m365 um i guess user now you have these kit connectors into the office space natively and you have the ability to actually work with flow and power apps 
but the data is kind of contained into what you see inside Office 365. With, the, with this platform, though, it extends out. So if I want to connect to Salesforce, if I want to connect to SQL, Azure, and manage instance, yeah, it doesn't really matter. You have the ability then to, and then that's the kind of, like, as a data scientist, I'm able to publish and get that data to a level where higher level business users would be able to consume it. And uh, one thing we're uh, seeing, uh, so we're investing a lot in these data connectors. Yeah. And we look to the partner community to invest in, in this area as well. I uh, look at this uh, like when the uh, wars between uh, mobile phone uh, makers was going on. It's all about the apps. Whoever has the richest app ecosystem yeah. will win. And uh, this will be the scenario here as well. Uh, the more connectors, the more out of the box connectors to standard technologies out yeah. there. Yeah, basically, any SaaS service, I should have an API, Correct. open API, I should be able to consume straight into, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still holding up for Windows Phone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're having an Android version. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so then the other kind of key one here, I would say, is really this idea of this common data service. So we, Microsoft's investing in this open data initiative. And if you think of an enterprise, there's probably standard schemas that you would use to define things in an enterprise. So there's users, there's sales, like there's these common entities to where wouldn't it be great if that company's kind of uh, data of record was readily and available and published in a, in a common data service for weather service. Yeah. So that anybody in the order can have access to it and be able to operate on it, think on it, analyze on it, et cetera. And Adobe and SAP, right? They're they're helping us Correct. in this space, right? Lou? So this is part of the uh, open data initiative yeah. that uh, Microsoft, Adobe, and SAP, SAP started. But I think since then, 50 plus uh, vendors joined. Yeah. Uh, jumped on. And uh, <clears throat> I come from a delivery background. Right. When I look at any integration project, it's always almost about the data. The complexity is all in the data, mm -hmm. transforming the data, matching the data, cleaning the data. So these three vendors came up with this mission. What if data was standard? In healthcare, we could to some degree standardize the data model. Mm -hmm. There will be differences between different uh, local flavors of it, but a patient, a healthcare yeah. provider, the big an insurance thing. provider, yeah. right? In banking, we're doing a lot of investment in financial services. There will be differences between different uh, geographies, etc. but a customer, an insurance, a mortgage application, there got to be a common denominator we can start with. So it's uh, it's an ambition, right? It's, yeah. uh, it's in its infancy. But the promise it brings is tremendous. Thanks, Lou. And then the last one we're going to talk about is really the AI builder. So if you're, if you're familiar with Azure Cognitive Services, which is a pretty much higher level set of APIs that you can use to access AI and machine learning, um, is now being baked into the Power Apps platform as well. Which preview. Is a, which is a it's in preview right now. Yes. And it's only in a, in a tenant in America. You can't actually do it in Canada yet, but it'll, um, it'll come. That some of it is pushed, like on, yeah, on Power Apps. Can, on Power Apps, you the can. Services part? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there is. Okay. That's, yeah. <clears throat> there, there, some of it is pushed now. I can see it like uh, cool. on Power Apps. There's the form. The form. There's <laughs> also a little bit of a delay in regards of, um, I would say, the tenants and how the regional like tech gets rolled out. Generally, US is generally first, and then it makes its way. We have this concentric ring model of releases, whether it's internally or even across the globe for the different tech to make it in there. It's all the first release, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. So yeah, we've talked about that. So this idea of doing point and click artificial intelligence is pretty good. Um, binary classification, text classification. One of the cool demos that uh, we saw, I think it was at Ignite, where a Power Apps person was able to just take a standard form consume it like you have a template and then automatically extract out all the data so this idea of yeah, ocr that's, that's actually what's was recently added the form the yeah. form reader to form reader. power up so you can if you have the same form like it was yeah you, you can you convert it from 
from a written form to this, mm -hmm. and you just say what which entity is, belongs to what, you can Correct. scan all the older forms and just put them up. Exactly. I mean, that's pretty handy if you think about uh, moving from from paper to digital. Yeah, digitizing the older records is, is, mm -hmm. a, is a... Uh, The text classification. So if you think of like Twitter sentiment analysis, right, like that type of thing, trying to understand tone from text. So that this would be great for, say, like uh, employee surveys or something, like trying to get the flavor of what's happening in the org. This is net new, too, that just kind of came out. So Power Apps traditionally was very good for the enterprise, like we would enable it internally. We just, this is actually coming out this month now, where we'll actually release a portal that will be able to extend your Power Apps to external users, whether they're off or not off or anonymous, uh, anonymous. So again, just broadening the reach of the platform outside just the traditional enterprise boundaries. Um, so I'll just, there's lots of good examples. Like Chevron, I think, has over 400 um, Power Apps already written inside their environment. Version Atlantic was another one. This I just mentioned this one because um, the team, the development team in this instance, wasn't very savvy on developing mobile apps, but all their frontline workers, if you can think about it, like the technicians, field, and all the inspectors of the of the airplanes, et cetera, were all on a tablet, and they had to be able to rapidly produce mobile applications. Well, if you're not an iOS developer or whatever, this platform enabled them to deploy, there was probably in the 40 to 50 different types of applications very quickly onto a mobile platform, which was kind of out of reach for them before. So not, not a bad case study if you think about trying to extend um, the reach of your apps onto the devices everybody really, really uses. So uh, the last thing I just got, as a sales guy, I got to talk about licensing, right? This is where we, this is where we make our money. <laughs> so this is the, because it looks like the Microsoft changed everything. They did. Yep. Yep. They changed it this month, right? So we yeah. used to have this idea of Power Apps, Office 365, Power Apps Plan 1, Power Apps Plan 2, if you remember that, right? That was, that was the division. Stupid division because you basically, I think, because you didn't, uh, you made the division of the licensing based upon capability, right? Which is dumb. Then they're like, oh, I don't know. What do I need? Oh, I need this. Oh, I need that. So what they've changed, where they've changed it is made it much simpler. So essentially, you're not losing capability. If I want to connect to a SQL managed instance through a connector, I can, right? Or whatever, whatever my data source is. Um, and you essentially license it at first by user per app per month. But what you see here is that at a certain time, if you're like Chevron, Texaco, and you have 400 apps deployed, think of your OpEx model of the cost of a platform to maintain it. The more apps you add to the platform, your cost goes down, essentially. So it's a different model if you think about it from how do we care and feed and pay for this platform if we develop it. Okay, I have a couple of questions. That's sure. the, the reason I'm here, the one of the things that have price. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there is another package for the, for example, for the portal, we have to buy the login package as well. Yeah, that that's, so I don't have that on that slide, but you're right, yeah. that's correct, that's okay. different. When you say one app, $10. It's technically, it's two apps. It's really weird, I don't know why they yeah, say Yeah, I, I think the model different. Canvas, one, one canvas, canvas or a one, model, yeah, and model canvas, development. one model yeah. one yeah. portal. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and for, for the guests and the uh, yeah. B2C and the both, yeah. If I, this is deployment, you, you said um, I developed the app on the, in four hours. Yeah. yeah. In production. Yeah. Okay, but in the, our organization, you know, we have a different environment. Mm -hmm. At least UAT production. Right. And so <coughs> there is a. So problem. you can export and then import it. And you've done that? It's not, You're different it's not working right now. Microsoft knows it's not working. Oh. They are not moving the flow. There is a problem. Okay. With that. Yeah. I use another way to. I don't have flow because flow is a wrapper on the logic app. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I got it. My question is, if my app is in the environment UAT and the production, is it considered two app or one app? Those are only for production apps. Hmm. Well, well, you're gonna, you know what though, Microsoft? That one? Are you gonna audit that one? Microsoft doesn't really make a difference anymore on a lot of these things. Yeah. If you have a tenant that you're using as UAT, you're gonna license it the I same have one way. tenant, five environments. I can't have it, yeah? Yeah, yeah that's okay, fine. Is it considered in the, for example, I'll, I create the POC for that. Should be per tenant. Not for <laughs> okay. an environment is how I look at it as, right? And when you set up the environments, you usually set up the purpose for it as well, right? Like 
I don't know, admin do that one. I'm yeah. just kind of, let's say, citizen. Yeah. And uh, this is per term, yeah? Mm. That's when I can move the, move the, I can move them by save as or whatever. Or yeah. Whatever. yeah. Okay. And then my question is, still for the, for the editor is a $40, yeah? For, I pay 40, 40 bucks. Yeah. And I can have as much as I Correct. Have for editing. For no, anyway, well, for editing, yes, you can do as many as you work on as many as you want, but you get to a certain number of users yeah. using the app, then you're going to have that crossover thing. So if yeah. I'm an HR, I'm only going to have maybe have access to these five apps or these two apps. <laughs> it wouldn't make sense to license them then that then way. It makes sense because if I have a more five apps in yep. production, yep. then it's 50 bucks that I'm buying a 40 bucks. Correct. That's right. That's your threshold. Exactly right. And technically, this is two apps. So to get to here is not really a big stretch. When, when you think about it. Go ahead. But, but if I go for E3 for Office 360, yep. then I can get Power Apps in there or not? No, they change that one. You know, no, you still have Power Apps in there, but it's just limited in the capabilities of what it can do. This gives you the ability to connect to any data source, any anything, to where if I'm in the Office 365 data set, so my own email or my OneDrive, I have the ability to operate on it there. But you could look at that more as an individual production productivity thing for myself. It's not necessarily something I would departmentalize or start to move out and share with broader and broader groups of people. That's when you would start to look at something like this. Okay, that's mean if I'm only using the everything on the Microsoft platform. Yeah. Still, I can use E3. That's mean all, yeah. all of my all, all right. of my user can use E3. That's right. If I go to the Oracle, I have to buy that one. Correct. Right? That's so correct. That, so that they call premium something, right? So that premium is the connectors. So that's yeah, the premium. Yeah, those are the kind of the different premium connectors, but they kind of got rid of it. They made it simpler. It's basically if it's in Office 365 data set, you get Power Apps with Office 365. If you're connecting outside of any of those things, whether it's SQL Azure, whether it's whatever Salesforce, then you're moving into this licensing model. What I did with Flow, calling a Flow. That's still yeah, that Office 365. Also that's an error. It gets tricky. So with, with there, no, it's true. That's a great question it's, on your flow question. Because now if you invoke an app, sorry, if you invoke a flow through this, it stays the same. That's fine. You're licensed for it. As long as the flow is invoked via the app. But if I go to my next slide, which is where you're going, and I'm a user and I want to start doing flows where I'm connecting to other data sources, et cetera, as a user and invoking and start to do a lot of automation, then there's another model where you're licensing the flow capabilities at a user level. There's a reason why we have uh, licensing specialists. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's very complicated. You need a PhD yeah. for that. <laughs> we have a license on uh, 21, July 21. Yeah. Is that still valid? Or you are going to, from October 1st? I think so. From no, you'll be grandfathered in probably for your term. Like I don't know what, when does the uh, when does the term of your contract run and finish? I think it's by, uh, no, we are in, we are government. Yeah, there is some a third party bought that one for us. Okay. And then I license until uh, July twenty two twenty twenty. Generally, you I don't know about government or about a third party doing it for you, but I've worked with lots of customers, and generally we don't make changes, big changes, until the end of your current okay. contract term. You should, because you're always going back to the use rights that you signed the agreement under that particular month. So that will always be your version of the truth as our licensing changes month to month, right? That's true. Yeah, you can, you can uh, until July 21st, you're okay. And I think you can renew it one more time. So um, I'm with Microsoft too, by the way. It's, uh, you know, a little bit about this, but not that much. Okay. You have another question? No, no. Uh, on the port, are you going to talk about the uh, package, login package? That one is very confusing. No. 100, 100, 100 user per month login package for portal. No, you can talk to me on that one offline. Okay. I wasn't going to talk about that. So I was probably going to get it set up. You done? Should I do my demo? Oh, you have a demo. <laughs> sure. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. right. Hopefully it'll work. It's always great when you might need to do something cool and then it doesn't work. So, okay, sure. did you stop me from sharing? Yes. And that's why we're practicing this today as opposed to when we're live. 
Okay, so this is our production CRM system. And here's the app that I wrote on my phone. One of the things that I have to do every week is basically update uh, applications. Sorry, update my opportunities. Mm. Um, and so I went ahead and wrote this up. Let's see. User group. Update live from user group. I'll save it back. <coughs> I'll refresh. And you see my, my Ooh, forecast coming up there, right? Nice. So there you go, right into the, our live production system. Like it actually does work. And that was for my mobile phone. So even I can do it as a sales guy. So <laughs> that's, that's the one. <laughs> And with that, I think Lou, you're up. You ready to go? Yes. So while Lou is getting set up, I want to do share something that. So I have a question. Uh, so if somebody wants to get started with this, yeah. What What do they need? Like, do they need 365? Yeah, that's your that's your easy starting on point. Like, so if your global admin in Office 365 enables it for your end user, because a lot of times they are very particular on what capabilities are enabled or not. That'd be a good playground because then you can kind of start to see how flow works together. You're inside maybe your OneDrive, you're inside your mail, it's your tasks, right? So you have to buy uh, Office 365 and then you have to buy Power Apps? Or no, what I'm telling you is there's a version of Power Apps that okay. just comes with Office 365 as your starter, right? Okay. As your st way to start okay. it. That would be a good way to do it. So, for example, if you wanted to create a custom form for your SharePoint list, uh -huh. yeah. that's you would use that license. Yeah, to that's perfect. That's, that's a great example. example. So is there some documentation on Microsoft website? <laughs> yeah, a lot of this. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Sorry. It's like yeah, that's one thing I think we also actually do well is we actually <laughs> document and write for the documentation. But yes, it's all, all with inside that portal. You just go to powerapps.com. <clears throat> you, you'll see a lot of it. it. This community of power apps is very good. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's actually pretty decent. And if you have questions, like go, go to a user group, post a question, and I'm sure that to a, a group here, someone will point you in the right direction. All right, so for the next uh, segment, I want to walk you through a demo app we built for uh, one of our customers, financial services, that we took and we uh, made it uh, generic uh, with the uh, Woodgrove uh, back. And the way I uh, position this when we're talking to executives, why we're showing you this, you have tons of mobile apps in your enterprise is the agility and speed by which today we can enable some of these capabilities. And the uh, scenario here as a branch uh, lobby leader, right? Uh, I have capabilities in my uh, uh, mobile device to service customers that uh, maybe do not uh, require them to line up and uh, uh, talk to a teller. In theory, uh, any uh, cashless transaction or any transaction that you can do with mobile and online banking, a lobby leader should be able to service customers who are coming in to do these basic transactions. And I'll show you some of these uh, capabilities. So a uh, search uh, uh, screen right, where you can uh, search by uh, different uh, uh, parameters, but the uh, most uh, common is uh, to uh, search by, uh, by a card. And uh, the idea is uh, you could uh, either uh, punch in the uh, card number <laughs> or we can do something uh, cool, like uh, take a picture of the card Is this a real card? Because I'll take a picture too. Yeah. <laughs> it's important, by the way. <laughs> this, this is another thing that Microsoft needs to add to zoom in. The camera is never zooming or zoom out. <coughs> That's true. You cannot, you cannot. This is another problem that we need to zoom into something, take a picture. We are inspector. We cannot zoom in, zoom out. Yeah. Mm. Valid, uh, valid feedback. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I would have thought uh, the zooming in and zooming out is a. Uh, 
device capability, but uh, maybe not. And the idea is uh, oh. <laughs> uh, the uh, the idea is uh, uh, the uh, picture uh, was uh, sent uh, in real time to Azure Cognitive Services uh, with no code. People who have done this before, and I've done this before, wrote a ton of Python code to do OCR analytics. Understood that it's a card, uh, parsed uh, the number, uh, and did a customer lookup using that. Sorry, you need to train that one. You cannot right away do that one. Yeah? You already trained your cognitive services custom vision. Yeah? We did it. The, so how program. do you train that one? Is it said the master card that one and uh, we, we don't already the model is data model the uh, train model is there well it does ocr and it sends back a uh, uh, json payload that has uh, what text it parsed on the card it's all yeah, uh, i, I think what is talking you, about you, you guys that. Use it, yeah. no we, i mean they didn't do it like microsoft already trained model it's already there on yeah. a, a, a azure cloud and the azure yeah. services so that that particular yeah, particular I, service. I look at the cloud services yeah. but i think we have to go to the we have to train that one okay you could no, so let's see okay, form fine. let's say you have a like a inspector form that's filled in and you want you want it to go parse the fields then this is where you would take a whole bunch of samples, you would train uh, train the cognitive yeah. services to recognize it, and then it would automatically. Yeah, but, but for cognitive services, because I worked on that before, like there are things like credit cards, business cards. It's already yeah. there. It's, it's already there. Yeah. 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 Even, with, even with forms, yeah. right. once you go, cognitive search can, can recognize entities like yeah. this is a name, this is a place, this is an address. Yeah. So so even for that, there, there are. Models that are trained. Do I need to have a license on that, or I can, with the flow I can call it? That's that is. I think that's a built-in feature. It's just when once you have it, it's. When it's is there. it? Is it? Do I need to have a uh, license on the? Uh, well, we're consuming an Azure service yeah. here. Yeah. That's a different. Uh, that would be part of your. <coughs> yeah, it's priced by uh, uh, not connector, but uh, amount of times you call. Consumption. It. Yeah. Oh, is it pay as you go? Yeah. 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 <coughs> And the point we were uh, <clears throat> trying to make here, uh, ideally in a bank uh, scenario, you would tap to identify the customer. But uh, we, for demo purposes, didn't want to go and buy a square reader. We showed the, the customer this ability of taking a picture of a card. So as an added identification step, right? there's an ID check required. Not anyone with that card. Right, can authorize the lobby leader. And uh, this is where we could connect to their book of record where the, all their IDs are. I think for this scenario, I'm connecting to SharePoint. Right? And the idea is how simple it is and how quickly we can enable business capabilities. That's what the power platform and the movement of citizen development is all about. It's not an anti-pro development movement in any stretch of the imagination. It's actually quite the opposite. I come from a development background. I want to use tools that abstract all this uh, complexities from me. I don't want to deal with authentication and any of that stuff. I want to do cool stuff. I want to be quickly able to take a picture of a card and parse it. I don't want to write the Python code for it. Mm. Can you mention uh, where is the country this bank is from? <laughs> it's the bank across the street. It's not your uh, where uh, you uh, are coming uh, from. We uh, demoed this to the bank uh, across the street. Did for you demo this to them, or they built it there? No, we uh, we so, I built so it. Okay. Yeah, so I built it. Yeah. Okay. Right. And from this point on, it's all about enabling capabilities, right? So one of the things we heard, many of our customers come in because there's a hold on a check they just deposited. Well, wouldn't a lobby leader like to know that as you come in? So here's an alert, right, that tells me, hey, there's a check on hold. There's no reason why we can't go and grab an image of the check, provide the rationale why it's been on hold and do a simple 
remove hold. And the idea here is the power platform is not a banking platform. This would trigger a core banking process to actually remove the hold on the check. But I don't need to line up for 40 minutes to go talk to someone to do this. One of the uh, very common uh, things uh, we uh, also uh, hear is uh, the ability to uh, either inquire or change the limits on a couple. I can never remember what the point of sale limits on my card are or change them. And typically the process is uh, the lobby leader or the teller needs to do uh, uh, an account uh, inquiry. Uh, so let's say it's this uh, regular checking account. Right? If I tap on it, it's going to pull in some uh, transactions history for this uh, uh, account. And then I can quickly see, uh, so if I look here, right, and I can flip to the last 90 day History. view of the uh, account, and then all looks good. Let's go ahead and uh, change that. I tap on the class limit and it walks me through a very simple, intuitive three step process. This is the current class limit. Here are some details about what they can and cannot do. Okay allows me to pick up the new uh, class uh, limit. And then as a final step, we showed this actually in two uh, different uh, methods. One is with signature paths, collect the customer signature or uh, trigger a signature ceremony with uh, an e-signature platform like DocuSign or Adobe sign, right? So you would collect the signature package and uh, it would uh, launch uh, that. You hand it over. I'm not sure if you've used uh, DocuSign before. Tap, 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 sign. And then go back and send the form to the printer. Because you said the word printer. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to be paperless. <laughs> Security feature. <laughs> Won't allow us to see your signature. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Lou, but based on your your uh, description, you're saying that it's saving them 40 minutes. That they don't they don't have to wait in line to speak to a teller. They could speak to the what you call the, greeter. the, the sorry the greeter right. But really, you're enabling the greeter to do the same task as the teller. If you were to give this app to the teller, yeah. they're essentially doing the same role. So it's not that, like, it, it almost sounds like you're turning your greeter into a teller. That's that's really what this app is enabling you to do. They can focus on the on the, the quick wins, like yeah, the low hanging fruit. That's right. Yeah. But but that's that's almost like saying, okay, there's going to be one express line for doing the simple tasks versus waiting in line for the more complex technical tasks. But the model, the model here also opens itself up to have like several graders in the lobby. Correct. That's or right. So yeah, so you're saving costs from a, like operationally, you're saving costs because a teller is probably more expensive than a, than a grader. Yeah. Um, but I think just generally the app, the way that it's functioned, it seems like it's it's integrating a lot of the, the, the simple uh, uh, teller, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the simple things into one thing, and potentially in the future you make it self-service, so you don't even yeah. need a teller; you just go to the machine. And Correct. So that's the where they want to go with this uh, uh, pilot, right? They want to put this in a kiosk, and <coughs> I walk in, and I tap mm -hmm. my mobile device or I tap my card, and yeah. I book my own appointment. Another pain point we heard: a lot of people coming in to book appointments, right? And uh, Right. Again, very easy three step uh, process. Right. Why are you meeting? Where do you want to meet? What's your preference? Trigger availability, show available advisors, pick a time and send a confirmation. Right. There's no reason why this can't be sitting in a kiosk and people can walk in and do self check in for queuing or for later dates. Yeah. Right. Sorry, just one question. Uh, you log in with your ID on this. Yeah. Right now you're logging, correct? Yeah. 
Yeah. When you say we give them to other customer to use this app, it's not gonna violate any licenses. No, we can we can leverage. Um, is it? Yeah, it's, it's called, is it Azure, and it's called Azure BSC. So we have a whole model. If you think of the number of people that probably have Microsoft accounts or Azure Act, Active Directory logins, there's probably a lot. So no, no, no. When, when the customer yeah. come to the bank yeah. and then they want to do that yeah. one, yeah. they don't have any account with us. They don't have any AD account or guest or guest as a right. guest user. They're not in the B two C uh, uh, Active Directory. Yeah. yeah. Which, <laughs> do you think D from the uh, Microsoft <laughs> policy or I don't licensing? What's well, I get paid. well, that would be they, probably they, like, they can do that one. What yeah. they would do is they would do it or again. It'd be consumption driven. Consumption. The number of offs that happen in a month, say. So is it the same? Yeah. What? There we go. You see what I mean? It's or more consumption driven versus the other way versus the actual user having a known uh, set of credentials. Yeah, and but just the number of times that something odds against it. You log in. You, for sure you log in with your ID on the public yeah. and then show all of that that you have it. But we don't have any other login page here. Yeah, we don't we don't create that one. And then user right now, we are thinking we can give them something as you say consumption. I don't know the model. I haven't thought through the whole case. Like you would probably want to make it natural, right? So they already have their debit card if they're going to the bank, and you'd probably want to tap into the tap. Right, that type of uh, off experience to be able to do it. Okay. You wouldn't want to do anything unnatural that they're not already doing, it, right? Yeah. So we have, the other opportunity is if you ever called like Rogers or Bell and you had to tell your story like seventeen times, yeah. Yeah. right? You're getting angry by the time you get the last person. But imagine if the lobby leader was the person that's able to like listen to your story and ink you your your case oh, basically to, to the so when you get to the teller they already have all the information pulled up and ready for you and they they can actually take care of you right that's one of the other keys that you have here. like in the case of where you have you go to your kiosk you tell them your to tell them what you want to do yeah the guy takes down some of your details sends it off to the teller and then they tell you to queue up for the teller you go to the teller and the teller says okay sir here you go sign these documents you're ready to go. That's right. Like, I mean, that, that, that becomes a, a, a teller visit of no more than a few seconds. Yeah. Imagine that queue being 40 people going away in like 15 yeah. minutes. It's kind of like yeah. the Starbucks at Union Station, right? Yeah. But they'll go and they go in the line, they'll take your order, right. and they'll prepare everything for mm -hmm. you. And that's what it's, that's one of the things that you can do here. Uh, there was one more question. You had a question, Mike. Uh, like, I'm not sure if I can remember. I'm just trying to see whether what, what you're implementing is sort of similar to what an ATM does. So I don't know. This is just another another thing when you can just centralize all of this with the ATM experience. So I'll take the ATM experience and put it on a kiosk. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is. It helps. It's it's probably a simplified experience, a more dummy or a more dummies version of an ATM experience or a bank experience. So, uh, like it's it's a good proof of concept. It's awesome. I'm just trying to see whether you can just take the ATM experience, incorporate this. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting you bring that up because that was one of the topics we discussed with uh, with the bank and. Uh, it's interesting to hear their views, right? Uh, to them, uh, deep customer relationship, deep understanding and building that uh, relationship with the client is what they're trying to achieve, not the transaction. These transactions are on the mobile device, they're on online banking. Customer doesn't even have to come to the branch to use a kiosk or use an ATM, but it's all about uh, strengthening that personal relationship between the customer and the bank right and one of the things they uh, they are trying to drive with uh, with this uh, pilot is uh, this ability of uh, again you're coming in to do a particular transaction but i see that you've been pre-qualified for a credit card or i see that you have an incomplete uh, mortgage uh, inquiry online is this something i can also help you with right what a great experience is uh, uh, to give a customer coming in to do something 
We all dread walking into the bank and uh, waiting to see a teller to do a transaction that you shouldn't need to be there for. The idea here is to increase uh, CSAT, increase NPS score, uh, and help the customer with whatever transaction they came in for. It's still the age barrier too. Like, yeah, yeah, so I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that I recently finished walking my mother, my 84 year old mother through an e-transfer. <laughs> and, and the comfort level yeah. of that age barrier group, right? She wants to be able to walk into a bank, yeah. talk to a person, have that person easily take them through the process so that they feel comfortable that that actually happened. I mean, this transaction took four days because, well, she didn't want to make sure, did it actually happen? Did she get the confirmation? Did I get the funds? All that kind of stuff. It's just, it was... Um... It's interesting you bring uh, uh, that up. <laughs> there are capabilities we surface here yeah. that takes the lobby leader to online banking. There you go. And they walk through that awesome. with the customer, right? Absolutely. Like applying for a master credit card, right? A MasterCard. It actually takes to the online application and they that the customer could have done at home. Yep. On the bank.com. Right. right. Yeah. But it's all about providing that high touch. Right? Personal service. Yeah. Personal service. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of disruption in financial services, right? And banks exactly. are becoming uh, a utility, right? Yeah. It's all about the service uh, that uh, they uh, uh, provide uh, to uh, to their customers. And a bunch of other capabilities, but I think you get the point. The point is you have a ton of uh, mobile apps uh, in your shop. Right? I'm showing you this because one, uh, it's uh, agile. Right? Two, it's built on the shoulders of giants like Azure, Dynamics, and what we did with the card scanner is something that your developers today need six to eight months to build and test and train. We know that because we've done this before. This is what the citizen development is all about. It's also for pro developers who don't want to deal with the plumbing. They want to do things quickly. They want to instead focus on cool stuff. We all want to do cool stuff. We don't want to be handling security tokens and doing a lot, right? We want that to be taken care of for us. I can ask, um, how many connectors would it require for this app to function, function in a real uh, world scenario? If you are intelligent in how you expose your APIs, should be one. There should be one API that this app okay. talks so, so to. Do, do I understand correctly that uh, you would have to write your custom connector then develop all the APIs yourself? Well, the bank has APIs today, and it's all proprietary systems that there are no out-of-the-box connectors for. So rather than connect point to point to each system, right? so build a layer in front of it, unless they are using standard applications that we have connectors for, then by all means. So if those. you were to rewrite this application from scratch, you would have one connector and all of this would have to be rewritten to to be compatible with your connector that basically returns JSON and you'll have to write your own um, kind of JSON Handling. data to send, which becomes very ugly. And so I'm just, uh, I'm not trying to kind of put the idea of this app, but I uh, know it's very easy and cool to build a preview de demo, but I'm just uh, wondering how would the real scenario work if it was a real data in a bank? And uh, another question, how would you uh, promote the app from dev to prod? Uh, if if it's, it's kind of a very tricky question. <laughs> no, I know that. Uh, API one API you can have one API but ten function to call. Yeah. If you see it many times they call it if you you saw there's some dot dot that's going yeah, yeah on the top. I think five, six times they call the API or flow. I'm not sure you guys call flow or API. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can have a one API, then they give you the I don't know the swagger, you don't need to do anything, yes. you just import it in the connect, uh, custom connector. And then what I what we do we call the different function that we're going to load, insert, just one API with that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, again, the flow, I don't know. I'm not really 
happy with the flow. Flow is failing a lot. I don't know. This is a that's, uh, that's a separate question. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, <laughs> imagine you have this. But you, you cannot do with the one flow. I agree. Oh, Otherwise, yeah, it's no. going to be mass mm -hmm. and not a ton yeah. of flows. And then all of the, those stuff, you have to go to the logic yeah. app. Yeah. Well, maybe it's if it has to be robust, it's probably not even going to use flow. It's a yet another API call that is robust. And this is as lightweight as possible. Yeah, and the production, just if you want to go, going from one, yeah, Microsoft is not moving the, I think the import export is still has a problem. Well, I don't remember. Every time one, I use it, it works. It's <laughs> not moving the flow. Right? Uh, under, we have the whole thing to think it with the Microsoft right now. Yes, yes, for, for, for flows, that's a yeah, different Yeah, but uh, the thing is, uh, uh, the custom connector for the, is not, you have to have, a, for example, in devs, this is yeah. my experience, okay? You know, you're, but again, the subscription key, what do you want to do? You cannot put in the subscription key <coughs> in the uh, import export. You just give you the zip file, you don't, you don't want to touch it because you're the citizen level. So in the last in the last <laughs> week or so, some people have started reporting that they're, like the ones that are on the first release tenant, they started reporting that they see the ability now to, to copy apps. Uh, oh yeah, this is a good <laughs> So this is when, very yeah. this is very powerful. Yeah. I don't know how mm -hmm. Microsoft handled that one. You can easily. Say, I have a, my trick to how to save as that one. I have my own trick. Nice. Yeah, that I can just easily don't talk to anyone. That's a good trick. <laughs> my my app is on the production. Yeah, it's be up here. So yeah, yeah. I have a, a, to how to save up. I go with this. Don't talk at all. I said I <laughs> we can do that with save as we can and then. Uh, yeah, I don't know how the save as works, but it works perfectly so without any bug. So strategically, the direction is, and I think it's in production now, you can try it. Uh, the dynamics solution concept is now the power platform yeah. solution. So if you know that the admin experience... Yeah, from, everything is moving to power platform. Right. Yeah. So now in solutions, you can add flows and power apps along with entities, and all the traditional things you used to do in dynamics. So that is not moving. I create a solution. I, if I, there's two ways, you Actually, know. I no flow is not moving. <laughs> and if there are extra yeah, so support, I, right, yeah. give support uh, uh, a call, right? There could be uh, uh, there reasons why it's failing, reason. but directionally, that's where we want to go. We yeah, want to be able to package uh, apps and flows along with the uh, CDS solution, the CDS entities and attributes, et cetera. Yeah, sure. So Otherwise, you can have to do all of the redundant on the different environment. I agree. Come. But we I, would don't, we don't. I would suggest that you uh, start a discussion on the on the meetup yeah. group, because this is a great topic that every everybody that, that either has experienced it or will experience it at some point like will, will suffer, right? Yeah. It, it would be a great topic of conversation, it would be a great presentation, but you probably more importantly, if we find that there's something that's missing uh, that hasn't been discussed, it's our opportunity together to actually go to the user voice and to actually like make a recommendation and, and upvote it. And all you need is 100 votes within 90 days for them to, they have to address it. Like, doesn't mean they'll do it, but they'll have to, they have to give it an answer. Does that does that work? Because there are votes since 2007. Oh yeah, oh, no, yeah, I vote all of them. <laughs> and, yeah. and for something that's very basic stuff, like oh, like why why can't we have, for example, yeah. a way that we, where the link in Power Apps just opens in the same window? That's in 2017, yeah. and it's a pain in the butt. Yeah, and then no the one is asking. get away with it is because their commitment is if within 90 days you get 100 votes. They have to address it. Uh, do you think that is from 2017? Oh, yeah. 2017? Like they have stuff from like. The, but know. they're still saying in review, but that is a new person. There's a number of developers that yeah. can handle. So we're going off track. We should yeah, yeah, stay on that point. thing. To Do how much more you got? We got to get our other friend up there. Otherwise, we'll be here. I am uh, done. Don't be afraid. I think for enterprise yeah. company, this licensing is expensive. They are start to uh, we, we start presenting. We provided almost twenty questions for Microsoft last week to answer about the licensing. A little bit vague, still is vague about the how it works. And it's for enterprise. Maybe the small uh, businesses is good, but for enterprise, remember the, the number of apps yeah, it goes down. So you just first one in that you're paying a lot. Yeah. But when you get to critical mass, it'll be cheaper than any platform you're running. 
Yeah. But if it's per user, yeah, but yeah, they're 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 not complaining, but they have a concern. That's right. All right. So this was Lou. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Lou. <laughs> Uh, getting set up. I just wanted to remind you, you all, you should all have received the tickets. Uh, there will be prizes. So I had some slides, but there, there will be prizes. Uh, there's going to be a draw. So if you, if you leave before the end of the night, then unfortunately it means I get the prize. Just so you know. So now, can you will get connected? Do I get a ticket too? Sure. Sure. How do we feel about Haniel getting a ticket? Is he allowed to get a ticket? We'll wait till his presentation. Exactly. Is it okay if I put your laptop on the table? Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't knock it off. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, you know, is. Should I have a specification? Just go to the team. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is what you want. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do you know Reza? Yes? Yeah. It's my boss. He's already <laughs> blue. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I don't think we need any introductions at this point. But uh, tonight we're going to talk about um, multilingual systems. So we'll do uh, around the world in 45 minutes. I think we're starting to 15 minutes late. Uh, but basically, what I want to talk about so, anybody here speak more than one language? Okay. Anybody here work with clients who are multilingual? Okay, that's at least half of you. Anybody whose government, your hand better be up, right? Um, you can experience that. So, so that's basically what I want to talk about is tonight the idea behind working in Power Apps and coming up with a solution that is not going to kill you, but still provide an awesome way to provide more uh, options to your users. So a little bit about myself. So some of you know me. My name is Sanyal Kuturu. I've uh, been working in, in SharePoint and Office 65 for almost 20 years now, aging myself here. Um, last few years, I've been fo focusing a lot on Power Platform, Flow, Power Apps, any sort of automation, lots of SharePoint. Um, and my motto in life is to keep things simple. That's kind of what I like to do. I uh, recently published a book on Agile. That's kind of my previous life before getting into uh, consulting. Um, also a three times uh, MVP of Microsoft in the SharePoint space. Uh, and I love being part of the community and connecting. So I'll share my information later. Um, the QR code, if you do, if you join it, two things are gonna happen. A, you're gonna get my contact info, and I promise I'm not gonna reach out to you unless you reach out to me first. And B, you may win some stuff in addition to what you're giving away. <laughs> so is that a LinkedIn one or? That is, the, no, the QR code, that's gonna take you to a form, oh. a Microsoft form, which is gonna use a flow to connect to Power App. <laughs> You'll see. You'll see. That's, You'll see. That's, that's the second part of the demo. That's right. Um, why do people always talk to me when I'm giving presentations? Please ignore Dave. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, now, go away. All right. So. Simplify everything. So this is not staged. This is for real. This is my family. Three little girls. Love them. They kill me. Um, but as I said, it's just trying to keep things as simple as possible. And that goes for anything. If I have to do something manually, something's wrong. If I do the same thing twice or three times, something's wrong. You'll get there with kids. More. <laughs> okay. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about multilingual. So has anybody, any developers in the room? 
Any citizen developers in the room? Everybody should put that in. Very good. All right. So, uh, if you've ever had to build a multilingual solution in the past, whether it's on SharePoint or an app or something, you might find that it can be quite tedious, challenging, uh, takes a lot of time. Um, th there's a lot of problems that, that are associated with it. So, there's a few things that. Sorry? I used to have hair. <laughs> you used to have hair, that's right. Uh, I, get, I say the same thing about my kids, I used to have hair. So, there's a few premises that I consider when I'm talking about multilingual solutions. The first one is simplify the management. Um, so terminology may change over time, right? So let's say that today you're working for um, a company and they decide to change their name. Do you want to go through and change every single app because the name of the company has changed? Or because they bought another company and now there is some rebranding happening? The answer is probably no. Reducing development, right? So does anybody like building the same app over and over? Good. No one, right? So if you can build it once, but reuse the same solution in multiple languages, bonus. Um, adding another language. So a good example is right now you may work for a Canadian company, so you must support English and French. They just bought a company in South America. You gotta add Spanish, you gotta add Portuguese, something else, right? Again, you wanna make it as easy as possible to extend the solution. Um, abstract, ex, abstracting the code from the content. So how many of you have ever faced the situation where you want to do something, a change to the solution, and you have to go to IT to make that change, even if it's just changing some text? And IT gets frustrated and calls you certain terms in many, many languages, right? Because like, why can't business just do it? It's just text, like, let them do it. So the idea behind my solution is keep it separate. The text, let the marketing go crazy. Let them do whatever they want. Building the solution is a responsibility of IT or the citizen development. And then the last one is creating consistency. So if you're gonna be building an app in five different languages, don't you want the app to work the same way so that you only have to create one set of training materials? Wouldn't that be nice? Okay. So I'm gonna be touching on all those five aspects. If I miss one, tell me. That means that I've probably missed a part of my presentation. So what's the high level design? So my basis is SharePoint. Why? because I'm a SharePoint guy. Two, because people are uh, more familiar with SharePoint probably than going into a SQL database or CDS. So it uh, it's, has become more of a common denominator for a lot of enterprise organizations. So there's essentially two lists I'm working with. One of them is called my string labels. So any static text will be in my, in my string labels list. The other one are list items. So if you have any radio button or choice fields or drop downs or anything like that that is, that is data driven, that goes into my list items, SharePoint list. Then I have my app, okay? Any form I have. And what it does is that form is going to load data from those two lists. I'm not gonna filter it, I'm not just gonna pull it up. I'm actually gonna be using a flow to get my strings or to get my, my, uh, my list items. We only have 45 minutes today, so I'm actually not gonna show you the flow part, but I'll just talk about it a little bit. And it's really the idea behind doing the filtering through the flow as opposed to the Power App having to do the filtering on its own. Now, if I wanted to build another form, guess what? I use the same lists, I use the same functions. And then as I go build more and more forms, I have these master lists for my strings and my, and my, my list items, and I can even create multiple if I wanted to. It all depends on how big, how big things are getting. So for different languages, you'll have different labels and different No, labels. one list. Oh, how's that? How's that? Good question. <laughs> you have about five minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will get it. So imagine I have a very simple form. I have a label. In this case, it says num, And I have a drop-down list. And I want to have some colors in it. So the current old traditional way, I would have a label, which I will call LBL name. And I will put some text into it. No. And then for my color drop down, I have a few items in square brackets. So anybody who's ever built a power app, that's how you declare your items, right? In the new way, whoops, I got too many clicks. I'm actually going to be doing lookups into my data. I'm going to say, give me my label for my current language. And if I don't find it for whatever reason, give me some default text or something that I know that something has gone wrong, which means I have to go yell at marketing now because they forgot to add the language. 
And then for the drop colors, I do the same thing. I go, I say, look up the colors that I need based on my language, give me that list. And that, just kidding. Okay, questions so far? Or are we ready to see some code and have some fun? Yes? Come on guys, wake up. I know it's in <laughs> <laughs> Work with me here. Okay, let's start with SharePoint. So, only two of you enter the draw. All right, um, I will have changed. I'm sorry. All right, so it's our platform. So there was a question about having a different list for every language. And the answer I said was no. So we're going to string labels. <coughs> okay. Whoops, what just happened here? Okay. So the way that I use it is I have my app. It could be a form or it could be whatever, just an identifier that says that I want to filter on this that. So this is for my Power Platform World Tour. My label that I want to use is called LBL Welcome. This is my language. Okay. So if I want to add another language, all I have to do is add another row to this table. That is my string, my static string. For my choice fields, very similar, but different. Okay. So again, I declare what form I have as my app. Uh, my color, that's the, again, the, my control is the name of the control that I want to use it for. What are the values? So the value I can put whatever I want. So uh, the value here is relevant for those of you who, for example, use dynamics. When you have a choice field, it actually has an ID, a number. It's not a text. And so I can put the actual dynamics value in here. So when I try to push my data to dynamics, I'm not going to put the text in there. I'm going to put the actual value in there. Okay, and then I added the column order. So if I want to order them in a certain way, and I have my language. These are the these two lists drive the entire app in terms of the text, in terms of the language. Okay. So I'm just going to open up. Okay, that's okay. So let's go to my app here. I'm going to run it. So here I have this very very simple app which at some point is going to show my language. My label right now is static. It says welcome. And then my choice list is also static. So that's how we built a lot of the, the, uh, the apps today. So if I look at my, my welcome message, it says welcome here. And if I look at my item list, my colors, it's hard coded, it's static. Okay. You could draw from different places, but we don't have the multilingual part. So the first thing we want to do is we want to find out what language am I currently working in? What's a good way to use to find out? Looking my Office 365 prefer, uh, language preference. So the way that I would do it is I'm actually going to go in here and I'm going to say my Office 365, uh, sorry, Office 365 users. I'm going to use a profile dot preferred language. Okay. Now, you see where it says EN dash CA? So that has two parts to it. The first two letters, EN, that is the language. The last two letters are my locale, Canada. Okay. Now, you can choose to build the app to work in different locales. So if you're in Australia, you may want to have different text than in Canada than in England. I don't care. To me, English is English, French is French. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say my language is going to be, um, so we're here. I'm going to say, I'm going to say set. I'm going to have a parameter called lang. I'm going to say this is going to be the left two letters of um, my Office 365. What was it? My profile dot for language, comma, two. Everything is right. So now, Back here, changes to line. 
Okay, so it's got E and it's my language. That's the first part. Okay? Good so far? So now let's look at the actual text for the label that I want to have that says right now, welcome. So over here, rather than saying welcome, I'm going to say look up. And I have a collection. This is something I've preloaded for my strings. And I'm going to say that title equals uh, LBL welcome. And sorry. So the title is equal to welcome and language equals one that I've got and I want to return the value. I haven't made a mistake. I'll try to refresh this. Okay, I mean, stick here. Let me check for a second. I think you have uh, label uh, uppercase W for welcome. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah, no, I think I probably just made a, a second here. I'm gonna cheat for a second. Uh, oh, no, that should be fine. Oh, the title is yeah. I'm pulling wrong information. <coughs> so title is equal to our yeah. moral tour and um, label. 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 label equals LBL welcome and language equals there we go. There you go. Okay. So if I were to go and change my language to French now. So I'm going to go to my window here, and I'm going to go as sort of English FR. And that's probably going to take about I don't know 15 or 20 seconds to register in the system. It's kind of for citizen developers, we don't know what you're doing. Power show. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Thank you. No, thank you. So there's ways in Office 365 where you can go and you can change your preferred language. There used to be a way which was taken away. I don't know why. It disappeared about a month ago. But if you go into Office 65 and change your language, typically it'll take about half an hour or so or 15 minutes to update. We don't have 15 minutes, so I'm kind of shortcutting it and going directly to Azure and changing the in my AD and changing uh, uh, changing my preferred language in AD. Thank you. I'm sure you've never seen this before or done that. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my app. I'm going to run it, and I'm going to do refresh, which basically reloads the same data. And you'll see it now it changes from English to French. Okay, but where's my language, right? So all I'm going to do now is go into my SharePoint list. Call marketing. I'm sorry. Call marketing. Yeah. <laughs> so call marketing. Yell at marketing for not having French and say I need French. So I will add PPWT, the label is LBL welcome, value is uh, bienvenue, language is French. And guess what? That's all I need to do now. So I just did a marketing activity and assuming that my app was working fine, which I'm sure it does, refresh and there it is. Okay. Simple as that. Very cool. So if I wanted to go now and add another language, right? As you can see, this now becomes the scenario of uh, segregation, right? Business, uh, IT versus the marketing of taking care of that piece. Add another language, right? So if I want to go in here, I'm going to say, you know what? We've just decided to expand to the uh, other side of the ocean and let's go German. And I'm sure Hans over here will, will tell me that it's right or not. Labels LBL welcome. Uh, you should build an app actually to upload. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 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 
both of them. I'm actually cheating because I was born in Germany. <laughs> uh, so D, now, what I would need to do is now that I have my German language, I will go back to my language picker and I will change this to DE dash DE, which is Deutschland, Deutschland, Deutsch in Deutschland, German in German. And again, you'll see it's going to do the same thing. Okay. So it, it just works. Now, it even goes as far as if I were to choose a right to left language. I can just put the text there and it's going to do it. Now it's not going to do it in the same order, but it's it's still going to work. I don't know Arabic, but I speak Hebrew, so I could do, I could show that, but trust me when I say everything is just going to show up. Okay, so that's an on the static label. Now let's look at the actual choice fields. So similar idea. So I'm going to stop this one here and I will go to my list. So here, instead of doing a lookup, I actually need to look at my full list and just filter the results. So I'm going to take this one out and I'm going to go filter my collection for choice field. And I need to say here title equals to PPWT, uh, control equals the RP color. I do want to spell it the English pair of the US, but the British, you, okay. And then, language equals to lang. And I will return the value. Second, just make sure that's right. Oh, label not value. Are you still in German then? No, right, uh, right now it's in German, yes. So while we're waiting for this, um, one of the things you mentioned is have it also set up for default. So if the language is not found, it just defaults to a uh, default language. I would imagine you'd actually set the conditional so that your language is if I don't find the language I'm looking for, then I find that it would be English or whatever default you want for that particular app. Yeah, so right here I will use there's a function called coalesce. Uh, coalesce. Coalesce. Coalesce, coalesce. Tomato, tomato. Uh, Coalesce, basically what it does, is for those of you who have not used Coalesce before, it basically takes a, an arbitrary number of parameters and it will try to find the first null value. And it will keep looking and looking and looking. So in the first one I'm saying, try and find a, a string using the lookup. And if it doesn't find it, go to the next string. And since the next string is not null, it's an actual string, it will stop right there. So if I were to um, to go to my, germ, my list right now in SharePoint, and if I were to go to my strings and I delete my German one, and if I run, we run this app, okay, it will give you a default. Now, what I personally like to do is I like to put the actual name of the label, the control name. Right. Why? Because then I can tell marketing, hey, for German, that label is missing in the list, so they can actually go to that SharePoint list right. and add it, and they know exactly what to add. They don't have to go to IT to say, what's the name of that label that's missing? What's the control name? Right. So that's, that's what I personally like to do, and I find that it helps. Put the phone number of the marketing person. <laughs> could do that too. <laughs> Which is, they're just going to call it. <laughs> My language, if your language is not shown here, please right, call this right. number. <laughs> so let's go to the choice field. So now what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to go back to my um, my English. So en dash ca. Click back to my app. Okay. Now you can just see that the, the color choices are, are showing up. So now, same idea as I did as I was showing before with the uh, the list items. If I go to my choice fields and I'm gonna go say quick edit. Oh. 
going to take all these. And I will say, look, that's easy. No. T. Rouge. G. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's been 30 years that I've been living here. And so, <laughs> uh, so, oh, wait. Um, No problem. You know what? I will add a fourth language. And wow. There we go. And call four. That's good enough. Exit my editing. Okay. So right now, I'm still running in English. But if I were to switch to French now. Seconds. So do you have to change it? Uh, it, it might be a cache, by the way. Yeah. Done a thread cache. Uh, it's just being stupid. It yeah. takes a few seconds sometimes. <coughs> yeah. There we go. There you go. So you can see that not only have I transited the numbers, but also the number of items available, the order, everything can be modified. Didn't have to touch the solution anymore. At this point, now that it's set up, I could just go to a, you know go to market and say you know go out of town, add as many languages as you want, uh, do whatever you want. It's just going to work. Now, a few things to keep in mind um, for those non SharePoint people in the room. So there are certain limits um, on the SharePoint list. If you have more than five thousand items, it's got to it's not going to work. So you might actually want to take that string labels list and break it into multiple. You may have one per app, or you may have some sort of a division by language, by app, by something else. Um, also, when you are bringing data back into a Power App, there's delegation. So it tries to delegate the filtering into SharePoint. Some, depending on what system you're using for the data, some will delegate more than others. But 500 is the default. You can bring it up to, I believe, 5,000. But there is going to be a performance hit. So, one way to improve the solution, which I'm, I can't show you tonight because we don't have time, is to actually do caching where you can store the labels inside of the app itself. And the only thing you do when you launch your app is say, look for, look up something in that SharePoint list to say, has the list changed since my last load? If it has changed, go and load all the labels. If it hasn't changed, just load it from the memory because it's way faster. Okay. Now, something else is right now, those SharePoint lists are accessible to everybody in the organization, and they have to be because you have to be able to read the data to see it. If you're using a flow, you can actually have a Power App call a flow, which then calls a flow to access a SharePoint list that's hidden from the users. They don't, I mean, there's no harm in seeing what the values are, but generally speaking, and best practices don't give users access to something that they shouldn't have access to. So using the flows, you can actually establish that kind of a, a um, security boundary. So. Any question? Sorry? You put it in a list that is in a site that is not accessible by the users, but the list itself to everybody. So they won't have any direct way to reach it. Well, I mean, they would have an access to it, but they would It's, be. yeah, they don't know the URL, but it's still not secure <clears throat> enough. I mean, they can still try to find it. The point is that if you want to make it secure, you want to make it secure, you lock it down. Yeah, there's ways to hide lists, there's ways to, to abstract it, but the point is the data can still be found. So Yeah, but I mean, like, if it's read, there's no... Yeah. Yep. Do you know if something like this has been used in a, in a professional setting for like a business purpose? I'm using it right now. Yeah. With a client, they have about 8,000 users mm -hmm. um, in Canada, um, Quebec, and um, actually right across Canada. But the Quebec, the Quebec was kind of the need for for having it in French. It's like something like just like a form that needed to be translated in different languages. And then yeah. So in this case, we have user. we have about oh my god, what are we up to? Like twenty, probably twenty forms. Uh, the biggest form has hundred and fifteen different fields in it. Okay. Fields and labels. Yeah. It's big. It's really really big. Um, and uh, you know some forms are smaller, but it's it's beautiful. Like it's just 
it's just really, really simple. We, we basically took the whole Excel or we took the whole SharePoint list, dumped it into an Excel, sent it over to market and say, hey, here you go, please translate. And as soon as they gave it back to us, literally all we had to do is just paste it right into, into, uh, uh, into the SharePoint list and just change the EN, EN to FR and that was it. There's <clears> nothing <throat> else that we had to do. There's some things you want to consider, like when you do a label, for example, uh, and you saw that before with my English, or not my English, my German, <coughs> German. but not that Hans is not here, I can make fun of German, that everything in German is like figuring, you know, 80 characters long. Um, but there will be cases where, you know, French text is sometimes longer than English. You can probably attest to that, right? French is longer, um, English is long, Dutch is also really, really long. So. Uh, being able to build your solution, so I, mean, I delete that label, um, to make it out of height or out of size, that will take care of it. But then you have to consider things like space. repositioning, sorry? Mm -hmm. The space between. Mm -hmm. The space, right. So so something that, that I also do in the phone, which is a completely unrelated topic, is making the phone, the, the, the apps responsive-ish. And by ish, I mean that I have to actually calculate the spacing and the sizing for every single control, yeah. but everything is relative. So if, if one language is long, the whole form just resizes automatically. And that's how SharePoint does the forms when you generate a paragraph form. It, it, everything is has like plus 15 and plus 10. And yeah. So it's a good it's a good example to look at to create a semi-responsive form. Yeah. And that's and when we talked about before, one of the challenges of making making these forms kind of really generic is or very powerful is adding the responsive form, the the, the size and the positioning. Uh, but going back to the languages, this is so so a few enhancements to the solution that I'm showing you today is doing the caching so that it loads faster if the data is not changing, uh, as well as um, potentially looking at breaking it down into multiple lists. If you know that this one app will only be uh, using data from one list, you don't no point to filter or to search them entirely <coughs> use a different form. So different approaches. <coughs> so yeah. When you change the language from a language that uh, from left to <coughs> from left to right to right to left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it automatically change the orientation of the input field as well from no. <coughs> right or no. you have to can you control that or is no control over it? You don't I don't believe you have a control over it. Um, <coughs> Microsoft is not supporting, instead it's not supporting the right to left yet. yet. Uh, it's, well, I wouldn't say that it's not supporting, I would say that it, mm -hmm. I would say that it is supporting it. Um, <coughs> the documentation said it's not right to left in the text file, text box you are saying, right? Yes, input, input, input. Yeah, yeah, in the label you can, you know, yeah, but in input. the text file, yeah, yeah. I think it's saying it's not supporting. Yeah, I mean, you can, like, I can show you here, just as an example, if I go to string labels, um, so here's one which is basically the welcome message, and then if I do the colors, to Maybe the only way you have a PC, PC, uh, PCF control. I'm oh, sorry? Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe you, you have to call it. Yeah, you have to call it. Arabs control framework. Yeah. If you have a PCF control, then you can do it. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, what you need to be aware then is a language, whether the language is left to right or right to left. Like that information you have to know. If I were to build a logic in, if I know that I'm expecting certain languages to be left to right, I could build a logic and say swap my label and my um, my value uh, for the client that I talked about before that I did for the, the company here in Canada. I actually have a label and then I have the value with the drop down right below it, which is kind of similar to how you were showing your app. And so the left to right has much less of an impact. Uh, so if we go back here, refresh. Okay, so you can see that. The information is still displaying. So when Microsoft says not supported, I would say, excuse me, but it is supported. But is it the right thing? It the doesn't right? realign. No, it doesn't realign. So that's the one thing you need to do manually. Actually, sorry. 
the text here is actually showing up on the left hand, on the right hand side. It is a label you can, but in yeah. a text file you can, text box you cannot. Like no. in input field. In, in yeah, input no, field. The input field is. Yeah, that's why it's not supporting. Yeah. About, uh, I have to try it out. Besides, we, we you need to add a like a, a period or something to see, right? Because sometimes that's different. You talk about something completely different now with periods and, and numbers. Where that's yeah, that's something. I don't even want to get into that. I know that's a huge. <laughs> I, I don't want to get into that. I know, but that's that's what I'm shows not, the I'm not that right now. It's a huge discussion. <laughs> seems like a good presentation to have. Uh, a, a quick thing though, can we utilize uh, um, the term store for multilingual instead of list lists? You can, but again, keep in mind who's going to be managing that content. Yeah. Right. And you've got to also consider that right now there's a limitation on lookups for the metadata. The term store, uh, you can only pull the first 20 items. So that's a limitation. So if you're going to have more than 20 items to pull, you're not going to get them. A SharePoint list is, I don't want to say quick and dirty, but it's it's a, a very slick solution. It works. And more importantly, it's something that users are familiar with. It's not something that's foreign to them. If you're going to take a marketing person and say, hey, go work with the term store, like, what, what is this? Yeah. Right? And then you're going to think about the fact that you have to traverse a tree and be able to determine, well, which level of the tree, is it the language, is it the label, is it, so you're going to have multi-level uh, trees that you will need to have or custom properties in your term store. With a SharePoint list, it's, everything is flat, everything is one simple. Can we store this in uh, on, uh, Excel Online? Where? You can, yeah, but what happens is with Excel Online, uh, you're actually ingesting that document right into the power. Yeah, it's very awkward. Yeah. Every time yeah. you update your Excel file, you reinforce yes. That's right. You reload really the file. Yeah. Very convenient. Yeah. That's right. The best approach is way better. I don't like my yeah. So again, so so the the biggest bang for the buck right now to sorry the biggest change to make here for performance reasons is doing the caching piece. That would make it a lot faster on the load. So having a SharePoint list and as soon as you create it, item number one will be your what is called your dirty bit or your dirty flat to say. Is it one or zero? Has it changed or not? And if it has hasn't changed, don't get anything else from the list. Just go straight to the cache. Yeah, absolutely. Again, you could also, I guess, you could also because of the limitation of five thousand characters. And we're talking in languages. Most vocabularies are roughly anywhere from two thousand to three thousand words, anyhow, uh, for for most vocabularies uh, to, to be conversational. Mm -hmm. If um, you need more than that, well, I can't. Imagine anybody who would, but <laughs> if you needed more than that, uh, you could use an SQL database and just simply have a BCS connector to your SharePoint to be able to manage that. You, you could. Again, it's it's a matter of uh, yeah. So you, that's another option. Now keep in mind that maybe two thousand words vocabulary, but you can actually have entire phrases here. So I know. I like I, like for example, one thing I do for my client, there's a terms and conditions. So in my in my static label. I actually have another field which is like a, a text table, like a long label. So in case the one is empty, go to the next one, and there I have a terms and conditions in English and in French. That's more. That's right there is two thousand words. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, SharePoint is not the only way. You can use CDS. You can use SQL. I mean, you can you, use. You are talking about segregating content from app, right? So like, I mean, and, and so SharePoint does. Present itself as a better model in that, in that yeah. regard too. So. It's 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 the segregation piece, and it's the ease of a non-technical person to into to manage it. Absolutely. You can build a Power App to interact with SQL to upload the, the field and do all yeah. that. Of course, you can. Right. There's different options available. Yeah. Sure. That was interesting cool. fact. Uh, and your uh, Dynamics uses the same technique to load labels. So. Uh, it's like a resource string right. that they track, and uh, labels are translated into every language. And the menu, the navigation, the commands, what label appears is looked up in real time from this resource matrix based on the user's language. Yeah. I think it's that's a I think it's an old technique even in, in software development, like in, in Visual Studio, where you would have a resource file. And you load it, but it's pretty static. Like if you want to copy that file, you have to properly <coughs> compile the solution, open the code, <laughs> open the code and recompile. But yeah, that's it's. I, I do, the concept is not new. I think by any means, it's really how how it's being applied. Mm -hmm. So, cool. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. So 
Has anybody... Has anybody... There's another power up. There's one, another power up. All right. This is the fun power up. All right. So as I said, I will have kids. There's only three raffle entries. You still have a chance. There's a QR code. This is a power app with a flow using an IoT button, and it has a form running on SharePoint. You need to throw in some AI in there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, N nice or not, uh, naughty or nice. That's right. So I'll give another couple of minutes for uh, everyone to uh, enter if you choose to. You don't have to. And like I said, I'm not going to email anyone unless you are emailing me first or adding me to LinkedIn or whatever. Or unless you have a really good joke. Sir, what did you say is in your hand right now? <laughs> this is a little, it's called a flick. It's a button. Okay. Oh, so okay. it's a, it's a, uh, so it uses, trigger. it uses, it uses Bluetooth to connect to my phone, which then through Wi-Fi connects to my flow. Okay. And it's just like, you know how you have a flow, you have a, a button trigger, a manual yeah. trigger. Yeah. That's the same thing. Wow. It's just cool. Like. Very cool. Yeah. There's a few people that are angry. I can't I see more than three. I'm downloading the app. You, still downloading the app. you don't have to download the app. You just have to count the, the QR. The QR. Oh, the QR. Yeah. <laughs> we cannot reach the URL. Oh, yeah. Hold on. It cannot reach the URL? No, I, that's the URL is very long, so we're we'll trying to Amazon. just yeah, Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> no, you, you, you don't have to. What is he? What's the to do? It's so we can enter uh, Bobby now. Bobby is drawn by scanning the QR code. Oh, it's kind of well, it's, it's uh, right. that one there. Is it bringing Amazon? <laughs> it's a tiny URL, so you gotta buy his book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that what it's taking you to do my book? I'm sorry. That's the first <laughs> Jokes on me. Jokes on me. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Jokes on me. That's right. Buy my book. Okay, here we go. Can you see? No, it's being blocked. Let me get this thing. Here we go. Now it's going to be in the form. I was like, what are you talking about the book? If you guys want to buy the book, it's like $10. What's the guys' deal? I sold 30 copies tonight. Here's a copy. All these hits. So, one of you is going to talk about the copy tonight. So, if you need some good jokes or bedtime stories, that's in the book. All right, I'll leave it up. Are you guys able to get these or too small for your phones? No, it's okay. It's all right. If anyone likes community, we have flow, but stickers, and power ups. So I'll leave those here. There you go. I have Power BI, but that's it. Oh, okay. No, that's not for the app. He's Power BI. I shouldn't take those ones. Power BI will sit there. Yes, I think it's true. That's what they're here for. That's cool. That's another one. All right, people still trying to take it on the QR code. Are we good? No, we're really, that was fine. That was what that one was like. Yeah. Ten people. All right. So this is how the button works. I'm going to click it, and it's going to start, kind of like um, roughly. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> this is not a lot. The connection to the phone sometimes dies, and if the connection to the phone dies, then this whole thing. This is a this is a question. How we can handle the flow in the power app? It's not possible. I don't want to the user see this one. Okay. This, oh, is a, this is a macro service. Now. I don't know. With if oh, you're error, talking about this thing here? Yeah, with if error, we cannot handle this. What do you mean? 
in the pipeline. I don't, don't want to. I don't want a user see this red. Uh, the flow is fake. Yeah. Five hundred. Okay. There's. I want to control it. Okay. Sure. Very good. Question. But I handle it for my flow. So when I make sure that if there's if the flow happens if there's a fa failure in my flow. Yeah. If you can put the if <coughs> yes or the, in the failure, do something in the. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always respond with my flow but with some, something. Yeah, but then you have to create every all of one of uh, kind of error handling in all of your. Uh, Best practices. Best practices. Right? Yeah. Okay, I don't want to use a flow. I want to use the API uh, connector. My API is done. That's yeah. How the how the Microsoft? Uh, this is a one of the I think requests that the Microsoft also provided. We need yeah. to handle this one. Yeah, one of, one of the problems I, is not that it, it's one problem number one that it happens. Second problem is that you cannot do anything about it. Meaning, yes, you see the error, but yeah, you, there, yeah. there is no one. Well, to, the fact that errors happen, I mean, that's a, that's a reality. And maybe when we have time yeah. for another session, I'd be happy to present a yeah, session on flow errors. Yeah. But that's a reality, right? If you're going to be building flows, you will have errors, one hundred percent guaranteed. Yeah. How you deal with them is a different story. The fact that we have that red message and we can't avoid it, that's annoying. I totally agree with you. Yeah, so, all right. Done. So, let's see who's going to win a credit card holder for their phone. <laughs> and you cannot win twice. Can't handle the suspense. I know. Ali. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ali. Sorry. So, Ali could be here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're not done, we're not done. Okay, let's pick it up again. All right. Yeah, I purposely do it so it slows down very slowly, like in a, in a uh, yeah. casino, like a slot machine. Yeah. It'd be uh, nice if you had a wheel, right? Like a real. That's right. This is for a pin, Microsoft Flow pin. pin. I don't actually yeah. have any power up pins. Oh. <laughs> Jenny. Oh, Woo. Congrats. <laughs> Another grand prize. Copy the book. Ooh. <laughs> Autograph the future story. <laughs> so that's what this button does. It's fun. Yeah. There's actually good uses for it. Oh, it goes. Okay. Going once, going twice. So who can think of a good use for this button? <laughs> so <laughs> you can't. When you cannot use your phone. So imagine somebody is working in the energy sector, you know, for example, checking gas lines and they got a oh, oh, yeah. oh, Can't win twice. Like I said, can't win twice. Oh I'm gonna build logic into it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because your name is the name. Need to add uh, re remove from list, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know what it is with, with solutions. There's never a, you always I one more feature, one right? more enhancement, one, one more change. It's gonna be Ali. Can be Ali. <laughs> Can you, Jenny? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh. No! <laughs> If I get another duplicate, I remove the two of them. How many, how many times did they fill the format? It's a It's a It's a It's 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 not random. It's, it goes to the whole list. It's just whenever I hit the button. Oh. But there's just not enough no, entries. Yeah. So what I need to do here is I will need to intervene and delete the two of them. Ali, you will not be selected twice. Like you're you're going to have to have 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 officially been removed from the raffle. Can I have the book instead of this? Sorry? Can I have the book instead of this? That's very heartwarming that you want to have a book, my book versus a pen. Yeah, a Microsoft pen. Pen is but... no use to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, you want to use my yeah, share. Yeah. Sure. All right. <coughs> well, thank you, Hanil. This was awesome. Uh, now, yeah. my bosses told me I would get fired if I didn't mention the company name there. Oh. <laughs> no, not true. They told me my bonus would be less. Um, so we have, we have some draws and we have some prizes. Uh, where's, where's John? Uh, he had to slip out. Oh. <laughs> so do I get a ticket or not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's live. Everybody, you, are we okay? Yeah. Can yeah, yeah. get a ticket? Yeah. All right. So just so we know it's not fixed, so we need to give Neil a ticket. And what's the what's the price, Hannah? Huh? What is it? Something in the envelope. Something in the envelope. Something in the envelope. Something in the envelope. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> Whatever is in the envelope, right? The offer. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, since Dennis was one of the last people to come, I think it's an evening out with Dennis. Yes, yeah. that's, that's right. Look, people are looking quite confused and concerned now. <laughs> Who's paying? Him or us? That's also unclear. <laughs> Did everybody get it? Yeah, that was, your, that was your opportunity right there. To get the second one. It's a very honest group. No, I really know. Really? Oh, no, I All right, Hugo, you're doing the draw. I'm just, hold, the draw. I'm just holding the envelope. All right. <laughs> no idea. And the winner is. Got to read it slowly. Everyone's got the same first four numbers. Oh yeah. Six, seven, Bingo. three, three, four, uh, did I mention six, seven, three, 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 four, oh, the last number is four. Yay! Awesome. It's so oh, long. Nice. Oh, yeah, I guess you should check. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a very honest group. No, it's mostly right. accounting <laughs> perfection. <laughs> and there are uh, loot bags in the. Out of the lobby. In or the, in by the pizza. Yes. Pizza and there's still pizza. pizza. And there's still pizza. <laughs> Not allowed to leave till 